Well, howdy there, folks. Welcome into today's video. Four different things I want to react to in this one here today. First one's up here, Palantir stock. Uh, we're going to kind of read the summary and, and go over some of the main points in this article from Seeking Alpha. Uh, Palantir, $50 is not unreasonable. This came out on November 16th. I thought we'd talk about that um, in Palantir stock going to $50. Obviously, we just cracked $20. Uh, so congrats to all fellow Palantir bulls out there. It's been a it's been a fun time to be a Palantir shareholder this year. That's for dang sure. Okay, then we're gonna get a little bearish. Palantir stock, look out below. I want to go ahead and uh, kind of talk about a, a few points this uh, individual makes in regards to Palantir stock, and uh, kind of share some perspective on that one there in terms of Palantir going down a lot. Palantir stock, fifty dollars, not unreasonable. Palantir, the enigmatic tech provider for the CIA Department of Defense, has attracted significant investor interest since going public in 2021. The company is expensive, but it offers visionary products that streamline operations and decision-making for government and commercial clients. Palantir's financials are improving with growing revenue, higher gross margins, and a swing from operating losses to profits. The company's growth potential and profitability make it an attractive investment. Now, first off, one thing I want to hit on that I think is important that I talk about this is and there's a worry from some out there. What happens if interest rates were to get lowered? Right, and what does that mean for Palantir's profitability? Because they've been getting a lot of profits from just treasuries recently, right? One, okay, we don't know when the Fed's going to lower rates, right? We have no clue whenever that's going to transpire, and we're actually going to get into a lower interest rate environment. It could be six months, twelve months, eighteen months, twenty-four months, two years, three years, four years, five. We don't know when that is. Okay, eventually that will happen, likely, but we don't know exactly when that's going to be. So Palantir's got quite a quite a bit here at least to make a lot of money from treasuries. Also, whenever the Fed does start to lower rates, we have no clue really what, let's let, put it like this, okay? We don't know how much they'd actually lower rates. Unless we're in some sort of epic recession crash, they're going to lower rates very slowly over time, which means once again, Palantir has a long time to earn a lot of money from treasuries, okay? At least a year or two, let's call it that, right? Now, if they do, let's say the Federal Reserve does lower rates rapidly and, you know, where some major crash is going on or something like that. Well, in that sort of situation, then Palantir's valuation, you'd be willing to pay a lot more for the stock, right? Because then if you're doing a discounted uh, free cash flows, you're running your numbers at the end, you're projecting and you're, you're dividing out by whatever the, the Fed funds rate is at that particular time. So let's say it's 1% instead of 5%, you're going to get a very different number and you're going to be willing to pay a very different price for Palantir stock. So... It's, a, it's something to consider, but I don't think it's as big of a deal as maybe some folks have made it out to be. And so I do think that's something important just to, to speak about there. Okay. Now, they, they obviously go into a ton of different things in this article here on Seeking Alpha. A summary. Overall, despite the risk, we like what we see when it comes to Palantir. The company's financials have never been in better shape. True. Uh, balance sheet and uh, income statement, definitely. And cash flow. And the company's product remains sticky. If management can reduce dilution and keep results coming in, and thus the premium multiple, then we think it is possible that a price target of $50 is with, within a few years is not unreasonable. We rate Palantir stock a strong buy. Okay. Alrighty. So my thoughts about Palantir going to $50. And by the way, let me just say this before I talk about Palantir to 50 and when I would expect Palantir stock to be 50 like if Palantir wants to have their stock keep going up over the next many quarters and many years, they need to become a company that quarter in and quarter out, you can count on them doing what? Beating numbers. They got to continue to come in, beat analyst expectations on EPS and are in revenue. If they can do that, then the stock can continue to fly and we can have a really fun time in the stock for years to go in the future. But they got to. Can they got to be that company that you know going into every quarterly of results? As a Palantir shareholder, we're all confident. We're like, they're going to come in, they're going to kill it. They're going to come in and beat. There's certain companies like that, right? I think Meta's been a great company like that over time. I think Amazon's been a great company like that over time. Tesla was a great company like that for quite a time until interest rates went up a lot and that negatively obviously affected their business. But they were a company for a bit there where it's like you knew every quarter they were coming in with revenue beats and EPS beats. Palantir's got to be that come that company. $50. So my opinion is I don't think we're seeing 50 short term. I do think probably in the next three years, 50 is realistic. Now, there could be a situation where, let's say Palantir overshoots, right? And maybe, you know, if Palantir goes above 50 in the next three years. 
If that happens, then you could see a pull down after that. Kind of like Tesla overshot, right? Tesla, you know, two years ago, Tesla was a $400 stock. It's a $234 stock. It way overshot. It priced in way too much good news. It needed way too much of a perfect environment, and the valuation got way too stretched on, stretched on Tesla, right? And so we went to 400, and now you know we're down significantly on a on a two-year basis in terms of you know where that stock's at, right? Obviously, shareholders like myself have made a fortune on Tesla, even you know uh, with the with the stock price being where it's at because we got in so far before you know I was buying that stock. What was it, 2018, 2019? And then people have also made a fortune on Tesla that got in at the very beginning of this year. Outside of that, you know, if you had bought Tesla in the last three years, you're probably down on all the shares you bought for the most part, unless once again you bought at the beginning of this year or you were like me and you bought many, many years ago. So there's a there's a potential that could happen with Palantir where just you know, too many people get too excited, way overshoots and goes to seventy or hundred dollars in the next three years or something, and then it does a Tesla where it's chilling out for uh, a bit. And there could be that situation. But yeah, I think fifty probably in the next three years. But they got to they got to become a company that consistently beats numbers, and they have to become a profit machine company like I think they can become. Right. All right, Palantir stock. Look out below. Let's get a little bearish on Palantir. Palantir Technologies released uh, their Q3 results showing impressive growth in revenue and international business. Eh, I don't know if they have, you know this is a bearish article, and I don't honestly don't think their international business was impressive. Not a, not my opinion on that. I think they got a long way to go with international. The company also achieved gap profitability for four consecutive quarters, pr- proving its sustainable business model. However, there are three big reasons we are bearish on the stock. So their main bearish points are valuation, right? Uh, okay, valuation, I can first understand the pushback on valuation. If you look at price to sales ratio, if you look at a forward PE ratio, I understand. But the thing you got to understand is Palantir is now going to start to be judged on a forward P basis, right? Now, people say, oh, well, it's very expensive on a forward P basis. Well, remember, Palantir is at the infant stage of profitability. Infant stage. Like, this company's just got there. So when I think about a business model like a Palantir, they're going to grow that bottom line immensely over the coming years. Like, if we just think about the next two or three years, I'm not talking about 10 years from now, just the next two or three years. They should grow their bottom line immensely year after year after year for the next several years, okay? And so they could eat up that forward P very quickly. This is something Tesla's been able to do in a lot of companies over time where it looks expensive and then they eat that forward P alive. And then you look and you're like, dang, it's not actually (laughs) as expensive as we thought, right? NVIDIA has been able to do this as well over time. So my hope is and my thought process is Palantir is going to be able to do that as well. Decelerating revenue growth. Well, the truth is, in regards to decelerating revenue growth, is based upon recent results, that's just not factual anymore at this point in time. If you look at their latest quarterly results, and I did this on a video, I think it was on the main channel recently, looking at their latest quarterly results, right? They've seen a massive reacceleration on a quarter over quarter basis, so a sequential basis, and massive revenue growth in their latest quarter on a year over year basis. If you look at the gap between what they just put up in revenue growth as far as a dollar amount in this latest quarter versus a previous quarter or versus a previous year looking at the quarter over quarter numbers. Either way you slice it, a massive reacceleration of revenue growth here in the story. And that's, I think, a lot's on the back of the AI excitement starting, AIP. And I think that's really going to, you know, let's call it bleed into the numbers in 2024 in a massive way. That's when a lot of these companies are really going to see the fruits of these uh, AI labor, let's just call it that. And that's what I'm thinking is going to play out with, with Pound here. So just on a factual basis, actually recently, their revenue is starting to re-accelerate again. And I think that's going to be a trend you're going to see over the next several quarters. Okay. Uh, next up, they talk about recession concerns. So recession concerns, it is a concern for their, their commercial business, but their government business is very you know, the government business is going to be there regardless of recessions, no recessions, things like that, right? And on the commercial side, really, these guys have to get a product like Palantir. You're likely going to end up saving more money than you end up spending with Palantir. And I think through the new two-day boot camps with Palantir, right, I think that's something that I think a lot of these companies are going to be able to realize, like Palantir's, whatever we spend on it, it's going to be worth a lot more than that dollar amount. If we spend, you know, $25 million a year on Palantir, 
it's going to bring us a lot more than $25 million back if we spend $15 million, $10 million, whatever the number is, right? So I think that's something uh, that's going to be very, very important as well. So the bottom line is, you know, as far as the stock price in the short term, you know, it can always have tough things. But the good thing for Palantir is they've got a reaccelerating revenue growth story. They have profitability continue to pour in. And I'm just talking about short term things, right? And S&P 500 inclusions potentially out there as well, right? And so that makes getting the stock price difficult outside of a major market correction crash, something like that, where the whole market just tanked, the NASDAQ tanked, the Qs tanked, something like that. Outside of that scenario, it's actually pretty difficult to get, I think, Palantir stock down in any meaningful way now at this point in time. Now let's go ahead and talk about Palantir. We have a lot of interesting developments here on the Palantir front we got to talk about. And, uh, you know, as a Palantir shareholder, I've been very pleased with what the company's doing as far as their numbers their, in their business model, everything like that. Okay. So this article came out here today. Uh, Palantir stock, the party is over. Okay. This came out just a few hours ago. No, there's a, you know, a bunch was written in regards to this article, but the, the two main things I would address in the summary is Palantir Technologies revenue growth is slowing and market saturation is becoming a concern. We'll talk about that. And then the second thing I want to talk about is recommended to take significant profits and hold a small house position for long-term growth. We'll speak about that as well. Okay. First off, let's talk about this whole revenue growth is slowing. Not factual, not factual. Okay. Revenue growth is not slowing. There's actually a revenue acceleration going on in Palantir's business model right now. Okay. If we go back and we look at the June to September quarter last year in 2022, the company grew revenue only by $4 million in that quarter. No, we go and we take a peek at the June quarter through September quarter and they grew revenue by 24 five million dollars and keep in mind that's with a lot of the big government deals actually closing after that quarter was already over and this is without even aip really having a big a positive effect yet the aip effect is really going to come in in a major way in 2024 so we got a situation here where the the best things haven't even happened for palantir yet right and yet the company has a massive reacceleration of growth, right? If we want to look on a quarter over quarter basis, they went from $8 million of revenue growth to this last quarter, they did $25 million of, of revenue growth, right? So whichever way you want to slice it, whether you want to look at a year over year basis, or whether you want to look at quarter over quarter, Palantir factually is not a revenue slowing company. On a factual basis, Palantir is actually going through an immense revenue reacceleration. And I think we're actually early in this revenue reacceleration. I think 24 is going to be really fun as far as all that goes. And so I think that's the first thing we got to address. And I think I, I was just looked at that and I was just like, that's not, it's not factually accurate, right? The other thing I, I think is, you know, a little crazy is it's recommended to take significant profits and hold a house portion for long-term growth. And I was just thinking like, I was thinking about Palantir's shareholder base, right? And I can understand on some stocks, it makes sense to take profits and, and run out of them, right? Let's be honest. Palantir's a cult stock. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a cult stock. And I actually love cult stocks. I love cult stocks. I mean, if the business model is doing great, and I got a lot of other shareholders that are focused long term and want to be part of that story long term, I love that. Because the best stocks actually in the market over time are cult stocks. Amazon, cult stock. Apple, cold stock. Tesla, cold stock. Berkshire Hathaway, the biggest cold stock. Think about Berkshire's returns over time, right? Think about that company. They freaking have to rent an arena, an arena for their shareholder meeting. Tell me that's not the biggest freaking cold stock in the history of mankind. Who else is renting out arenas? Come on, man. Who else is renting out arenas? You could be flipping my flapjacks here, okay? By the way, it's completely random, but while I was searching for a, an arena picture of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, <laughs> Buffett, Gates, and Ludacris? Like, that's so random. Like, I, I was like, I had to click on it. I had to make sure it wasn't AI. No, that's an actual picture. Ludacris was, this is probably, uh, this photo looks like it's probably 15, 20 years old, but I just thought that was funny. What's Ludacris doing there, okay? So the bottom line is, I don't think they understand Palantir shareholder base. These folks are not in Palantir. Like, you don't buy a stock like Palantir to just be in a short term. You're in this stock for the next, you're in this stock for the next, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? That's what people are thinking. I know people that are predicting that Palantir stock is going to 500 plus dollars a share. I know people that are making predictions that Palantir is going to 100 plus dollars a share over the coming years. 
you know, these folks, uh, they're in this for the long term. That's the bottom line with that. You would say, take some profits here. No, okay, these people are not interested in taking profits. They have no, no, no belief, no thought of like, oh, I'm going to take profits. And hell no, okay. It's a different, this is a different group of individuals. No, I saw this news came out here today. Peter Thiel's Mirthro LP sells $48 million in Palantir shares, right? And Peter Thiel was an early stage investor in Palantir. Peter Thiel's uh, venture capital fund sold $48 million in Palantir Technologies, shares acquired a decade ago. So one could look at this if you, you know, look at it from a negative perspective and say, oh, Peter Thiel must think Palantir stock's overvalued, it's going to go down, things like that. Means held the stock for you know a decade. Uh, so at the end of the day, if he wants to sell some shares, it's their choice, right? Teal co-founded Palantir 20 years ago. The enterprise software company went public in 2020, and the stock has doubled since then. Vanguard is a top shareholder of Palantir with 8.76% of the stock corn and tips rank. Vanguard index funds, interesting, holds 7.13% stake. We haven't even gotten the SP500 yet. I just want to put that out there. On Wednesday, it was reported that billionaire investor Felipe Management took a position, <laughs> some of these words, I'm like, I'm not even going there, okay, we'll just say Felipe, billionaire Felipe, took a position in Palantir Technologies on Wednesday, that's good. Earlier this month, Palantir issued guidance and topped uh, estimates, after which Webb Bush called the company the messy of AI, right, and that leads us into this, I don't know if you guys saw this, came out on Monday. Investment firm Webb Bush Security said on Monday that a new bull market in technology stocks has started, with spending set to accelerate next year, and Apple is a top pick in the space. Analyst Dan I said that Wall Street is significantly underestimating the amount of spending in the cloud and artificial intelligence for the next year. As a result, he thinks spending will rise between 20 and 25 percent. Wow. Which is especially as use cases explode in the enterprise and consumer spaces. Quote, while it is still murky macro in the Fed shadow, 10 year remains uh, that's called albatross around tech stocks in multiples. We believe a short covering for the ages for the tech sub sector into year end is on the horizon and the fundamental picture for growth tech stocks is rock solid based on the recent uh, recent checks, he said. Quote, we believe the new tech bull market has now begun and, te and tech stocks are set up for a strong 2024 as AI spending tidal wave hits shores of the broader tech market, right? And he thinks the companies that are going to benefit the most are Apple, which is debatable. Uh, Microsoft, which is kind of a no-brainer. Of course, Microsoft's going to benefit huge with their chat GPT investment and obviously what they're doing um, on their own product side. Google, yes, but the, a lot of people are worried about is Google just offsetting some of their other business there. So that's a kind of a debatable one. Palo Alto Networks, no opinion there. Palantir, obviously, right? And he calls Palantir the messy of AI. Zscaler, CrowdStrike, MondoDB, probably, okay? So I thought that was interesting there as well, right? Now, this is such an underrated thing. And I mean, it's absolutely underrated. And, and, you know, I've mentioned it and mentioned it, and I'm going to keep mentioning it because I just think it's massively underrated. I saw this article uh, at a Motley Fool yesterday, the, the 140 plus reasons to remain bullish on Palantir's growth prospects. Palantir has more than 140 artificial intelligence boot camps planned with companies this month, right? And I just think it's so underrated. Uh, and I don't think there's enough people talking about AIP in, in these boot camps in the matter, you know, the fact that in a day or two, customers can get results and see how Palantir can help them versus, you know, it used to be like a six month process. I think that's just a fundamental change in the business model that I think we're going to see help the business dramatically in 2024 and in future years. I think that's way underrated right now. And I think that's something the bears on Palantir are not even looking at. And I think even a lot of the bulls are not paying close enough attention to that. I think it's massive, man. And uh, we'll see how massive it is in 2024 when we look at the numbers, right? No. And in regards to the numbers, we have certain very exciting things going on. I, I saw this illustration out here in regards to Palantir and kind of where their money's going, you know, how much money's coming in, different different ways. Obviously, we can see the government is the weakness of the business right now, 12%, but don't be surprised if those government numbers boost up big time, big time in 2024. Based upon a lot of these big deals Palantir has going through right now, Ooh, baby, don't be surprised that government number is a whole lot better than that next year. Commercial with AIP, don't be surprised if that number reaccelerates as well. But that's not the important part of this. The important part is right here, okay? 16.8% total revenue growth, but the gross profit, 21.6% growth there, right? 
Now, obviously, the company also went from a loss to net income. That's a whole other situation. But I just think this is very important. They're growing, they're growing gross profit at a much faster clip than they're growing revenue. Now, on top of that, they dropped operating expenses 5%. They dropped sales and marketing 3.6%. And they also dropped general administrative 13.8%. So what they're setting up for is a lean and mean Palantir at this point in time, where every dollar that comes into Palantir is going to be so much so much more important than a dollar previously. And so much more that dollar is going to hit the bottom line now than, than previously expected. And so I'll give you kind of an example here. Okay, here's kind of an example. So let's say uh, Palantir grows revenue 20% in 2024, which I think is actually a conservative number. But let's say they do that. I will expect net income to be at minimum 30%, but probably much more than, than 30%. The way they're keeping their expenses in line, their operating expenses, right? And the fact that the gross profit's growing much more rapidly than the revenue, that smells like a situation where we're going to see a net income growth far exceeding, far exceeding whatever revenue growth they have. And that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the holy grails of business models, when you can have your bottom line grow at a much faster clip than your top line. Let's say we got a situation where revenue grows like 30% in 2024, which I don't think is a stretch out. I think that's probably like a 50-50, to be honest, whether they grow like 30% revenues. I would expect net income to be up 45% plus in that sort of situation. 45% plus, plus. So like 45% is the minimum amount in that sort of scenario. So we're going we're gonna to watch a Palantir emerge here in 2024. Then in my opinion, it's going to be a cash flow machine and a profit machine. Very different than the Palantir we used to have, which was just known for massive losses and stock-based compensation, right? Oh, did I forget the share buyback on? Oh, oh, man. Oh, man. Think about the share buyback added on top of that, right? I mean, my gosh, you take all those shares off the market, and, and, and you know what's going to happen there, EPS? <laughs> oh, my gosh. As their net income increases dramatically next year, holy smoke, because that's no dang flipping flapjack and jokers, right? That's huge. And so with Palantir, really the only negative thing people can say at this point, in my opinion, the only thing that you could say negative about Palantir that at least holds some weight, I'll put it like that, okay, is the stock is expensive, right? It trades at 67 times expected, you know, expected forward P for next year's numbers. That, there's no doubt about it. That's expensive. That's over 3x what the average stock in the market trades at, right? But if we think about this, one is, I think analysts are far too low with their revenue estimates. And if they're far too low with their revenue estimates, they're probably way further off in regards to their earnings per share. So there is a potential here. I think a pretty high probability that the reality is this, this company is not trading at 60, 67 times next year's numbers. There's a very high probability that maybe it's trading at 45 times or 50 times next year numbers. Now, those might still seem expensive, but for a company that has Palantir sort of growth trajectory over the next five to 10 years, that's not expensive at all. And so that's where you get in this kind of conflicting opinion here about is Palantir expensive or not, right? No, I also saw a lot of people making a big deal because Kathy Wood just very recently bought a bunch of, well, a bunch is relative, but she bought Palantir stock recently, okay? Now, personally, I'm not that interested in this, okay? I don't, I don't know about this, okay? Here's the deal. Kathy Wood was selling massive amounts of shares as that stock crashed, okay? And then once it started going up, it seems like she started to buy. Okay, cool. But it's just like, you know, I, I don't like that right off the bat. Secondly, she, you know, 1.35% of the portfolio, is that conviction? Is that conviction in Palantir? Or is that just kind of like, oh, Palantir seems like it's kind of a hot stock. Let's buy some shares. That, that's another thing I kind of wonder here. With a 1.3% of the portfolio? Like, like, here's the way I think about it, right? If I have conviction in a stock, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride big money in that stock, right? If we look at my MAG6, which is my Magnificent 6 stocks, right? 34% Meta, 22% Tesla, 8.5% Amazon, 6% Elf, 6% Palantir, and 5.6% in PayPal, right? I'm going to ride the stocks that I have the most conviction in. I'm going to have those stocks be heavy, heavy weights, if I have a stock that's like one percentage of the portfolio, it means it's likely more speculative to me, and I don't have, um, you know, I don't feel the most comfortable putting a huge portion of money in that, right? And I have some stocks that that would kind of fit that criteria, right? The Vons, the Planets, Honest, Fubos. Those are stocks I I believe in long term, and I, you know, I hope and I think they can become these big things, and 
all that, all that stuff, but at the end of the day, they have immense risk. And so I keep those position sizes obviously smaller, right? Versus these companies that I think, you know, have very attractive risk rewards, and I think they're not taking the, the most risk out there. So the bottom line is with the Kathy Wood stuff, 1% of the portfolio, yeah. okay? Now, the last thing I'll say here is let the short-term crap be the short-term crap. You know, stocks like Tesla, stocks like Palantir, they're always going to have stuff crop up. They're always going to have negative articles, negative things said about them. You know, let that be what that's going to be. Focus on the long term. You know, if you love certain stocks for the long term, focus on them long term. You know, make sure the business model is going where you want the business model to go over the coming years. And if that's all lining up, cool. And if macro gets in the way for a bit, it is what it is. Just understand the macro will not always be there. And eventually the macro subsides and eventually you get back to a healthy demand environment. And all those things kind of, you know, go from there and growth and prosper and those sorts of things, folks. So. The